Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. We are very excited by your presence today at the fifth lecture of the distinguished lecture series organized by the Department of English Jamia Milia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Henry A. Juru, McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest and the Paul of Freer Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy, who is here to deliver the much anticipated talk title, Pandemic Politics, Critical Pedagogy, and the Scourge of Neoliberalism. We will be recording today's lecture, and at the same time, it is being live streamed on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Giroux's talk, and all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will then be addressed to Professor Giroux. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. Simi Malhotra is professor and head of the department at the Department of English, Shamia Milia Islamia, Delhi. I request Simi ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor Giroux, ma'am. Uh, Professor Henry Giroux, our esteemed speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us from across the world and across time zones. I, on behalf of the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education, MHRD Spark supported distinguished lecture series. Friends, uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the fifth lecture of this series, which is a part of the ongoing collaborative project that we have on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We're extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Henry Ejiu, one of the leading intellectuals of our times, as our speaker this evening. It is indeed an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Ejiu, and we're all eagerly waiting to hear him speak on pandemic politics, critical pedagogy, and the scourge of neoliberalism. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Giroux and I thank him profusely for indulging us and for so readily agreeing to be a part of our series. I once again extend a very warm welcome to Professor Giroux and, and to all of you. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Giroux formally, though he needs no introduction here or anywhere in the world. Professor Henry A. Giroux is the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest and the Paulo Fred Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy. An internationally renowned writer and cultural critic, Professor Henry Giroux has authored, or co authored over 65 books, written over 100 scholarly articles, delivered more than 250 public lectures, been a regular contributor to print, television, and radio, and is one of the most cited Canadian academics working in any area of humanities research. In 2002, he was named as one of the top 50 educational thinkers of the modern period in 50 Modern Thinkers on Education from Piaget to the Present as part of the Rutledge's Keys Guides publication series. In the same year, he delivered the prestigious Herbert Spencer Lecture at Oxford University. In 2007, he was named by the Toronto Star as one of the 12 Canadians changing the way we think. He has received honorary doctorates from Memorial University in Canada, Chapman University in California, and the University of the West of Scotland. He is on the editorial and advisory boards of numerous national and international scholarly journals, and he has served as the editor or co-editor of four scholarly book series. He co-edited a series on education and cultural studies with Paul Frere for a decade. He is on the board of directors for Truth Out. Professor Giroux is a regular contributor to a number of online journals, including Truth Out, Truth Dig, and, Cultural, uh, and Counterpunch. He has published in journals including Social Texts, Third Text, Cultural Studies, Harvard Educational Review, Theory, Culture, and Society, and Monthly Review. His books have been translated into many, many languages, and his work has appeared in the New York Times and many other periodicals. He's also interviewed regularly in the media. His primary research areas are cultural studies, youth studies, critical pedagogy, popular culture, media studies, social theory, and the politics of higher and public education. He's particularly interested in what he calls the war on youth, the corporatization of higher education, the politics of neoliberalism, the assault on civic literacy, and the collapse of public memory, the educative nature of politics, and the rise of various youth movements across the globe. 
Professor Giroux, I can't thank you enough for being so very generous with your scholarship and with your time and being with us. It's such an honor for us to host you, Professor Giroux. Over to you. First of all, Simi, if I may, thank you very much for inviting me and for how kind you and patient, patient you've been with uh, our correspondence. I, I'm really, truly honored and it really is my pleasure to say the very least. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me try to say, what I'm gonna to do today. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna look basically at how politics is mediated through a, a series of contemporary events, all of which have become visible in the COVID-19 crisis. And this includes, of course, not only the crisis of education in which people begin to think and or rethink the very nature of politics and power, but also the related incidents, related issues that often are not talked about enough, whether we're talking about systemic racism, cultural nationalism, social and economic inequalities. And of course, one of the things that I've been enormously interested in in the last 15 years is the rise of fascism and its updated forms across the globe, which we are now seeing, of course, in ways that are rather startling and, and to say the very least, dangerous. So let me, let me begin my talk. We currently live in a world that resembles a dystopian novel that could only be imagined as a harrowing work of fiction or biting political commentary. The works of George Orwell, Ray Bad Bradbury and Sinclair Lewis now appear as an understatement in a world mocked by horrifying political horizons, a world in which fascistic and medical pandemics emerge. In an age of uncertainty, time and space have collapsed into a gulf of shared apprehensions, relentless anxieties, and the possibility of an authoritarian abyss. As medical pandemics emerge with a plague of state and corporate violence, the terrors of everyday life point to a world that has begun to descend into darkness. Death and sickness haunt our existence as the pandemic spreads to those establishments, spaces, and materials that impact on the most intimate aspects of our daily lives. Images of fear, if not apocalyptic visions, flood the, flood the news as increasing numbers of people either get sick or die from COVID-19 virus. In too many countries, people can no longer shake hands, embrace friends, feel safe using public transportation, or sit comfortably inside a restaurant or movie theater. Doorknobs, counters, the breath we inhale, and anything else that offers the Delta virus in particular. A resting place is comparable to a ticking bomb ready to explode in, in massive suffering and untold deaths. Long-term stretches of self-isolation confine the privileged, the safety, or to the safety of their homes or protected workplaces. On the other hand, for the poor, the disadvantaged, the incarcerated, and the elderly, there are no safe spaces only the daily risk of contamination, sickness, or worse. In both the United States and India, among other countries, hospitals are understaffed, patients turned away from critical care, and, pe and people, especially the poor and the marginalized, die because of a scourge of a neoliberal economy that privileges capital over human needs. Amid this collective terror, the architecture of authoritarianism has resurfaced with a vengeance, not only in the United States, but also in Brazil, India, and the United Kingdom in the form of a waking nightmare with a cast of horrors. Surveillance technologies proliferate. Armed militia in the United States defend groups refusing to wear protective masks and intimidate those who do. Voter suppression laws are pushed by right-wing Republican politicians. Conspiracy theories displace logic and reason, and mass shootings in the U.S. have now become routinized, suggesting that violence has become a normal way of everyday life. In India, the viral drama takes a different but equally pernicious turn as Hindu nationalism is further mobilized and strengthened. Both countries have blurred the boundaries between science and pseudoscience, medical science, and blatant quackery. In India, Inequality and wealth and power has taken an even heavier toll as only 9% of the population is vaccinated. The COVID-19 plague points to more than a medical, medical pandemic and must be understood within a more comprehensive ideological, political and ideological context. The COVID-19 crisis 
is deeply rooted in years of neglect by neoliberal governments that denied the importance of public health, the public good, and the welfare state while defunding institutions that make them possible. The current pandemic cannot be removed from the crisis of massive inequalities in wealth, income, and power that grew by leaps and bounds since the 1970s. None of these issues can be separated from the broader struggles for social equality, economic justice, and democracy. <clears throat> Nor can the current pandemic be disconnected from a crisis of democratic values, critical education, and what I call the civic imagination. Underlying the current magnitude of the current pandemics we now face is the crucial question, what kind of world do we wanna live in today? And what kind of society do we wanna build for future generations? <clears throat> The COVID-19 pand pandemic has revealed the ugly and the cruel face of a predatory neoliberal capitalism, what I've often called gangster capitalism, intent on restoring class power and consolidating the rapid concentration of capital. It's wedded to the privatization of public services driven by a survival of the fittest ethos and it tears up all forms of social obligation. Under neoliberalism, everything is for sale. And the only obligation of citizenship at its worst is consumerism. Neoliberalism ignores basic human needs such as quality health care, decent wages, available child care, and free quality education for all. It views government as the enemy of the market, or, cer or certainly government responsibility as the enemy of the market, limits society to the realm of the family and individual, embraces a kind of fixed hedonism, and challenges the very idea of the public good. Under neoliberalism, economic equality is divorced from social cost, while politics that produce racial cleansing, militarism, and staggering levels of inequality in wealth and power constitute an updated form of fascist politics that I have labeled as neoliberal fascism. This is no small matter. And I just want to interrupt this for a moment to say, under neoliberalism, when you, live, when you, when you separate economic activities and social activities and political activities from social cost, what in, in effect you do is evacuate the terrain of social responsibility. You evacuate the terrain of ethics. You evacuate the ter terrain of justice. When you think about this ideology and the global reach that it has and the utter devastation that has emerged as a result of, of that, that maxim, so to speak, that central element of its own cruelty and destruction, it becomes literally mind blowing. This is a worldview that argues that the market should govern not only the economy, but all aspects of society. Its ultimate purpose is the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a financial and social elite. Neoliberal fascism combines the harshest elements of a cutthroat capitalism with an unabashed embrace of white nationalism and white supremacy. And we're seeing this in particular in the United States and in Germany and in other places where in the sense of, of, of a, a racism, a systemic racism that was marginalized in the past has now become a badge of honor. Through its destruction of the economy, environment, education, and public health care, neoliberal policies created a Petri dish for COVID-19 to wreak heaven, havoc and world, worldwide destruction. How else to explain that the United States is the richest country in the world, yet it surpasses any other country with more than 38 million infections and more than 631,000 deaths. How else to explain over 32 million infections and over 34,000 deaths in India? In both countries, scenes of mass death are coupled with images of body bags and people being turned away from overwhelmed hospitals. In one of the alleged democracies, India's health system is on the brink of collapse. This is not surprising given that its spending is a mere 3.5% of the gross national product, far lower than the world's wealthiest countries. Instead of pro promoting mask wearing, Modi holds mass rallies, testifies, testifying to emerging of ignorance and a politics in the service of death. What the COVID-19 crisis makes clear is that the market cannot provide basic social provisions and meet public health needs. The market's anti-public and anti-democratic ethos is at odds with crucial demands of civic leadership and government responsibility, given its long-standing belief that the needs of capital take priority over human needs. Not surprisingly, over time, 
public goods have withered and begin to and begun to fail. That is public the publicly owned bones of society, public education, public health system, roads, bridges, levees, water systems have been underfunded and pushed to the breaking point of disrespair, disrepair and dysfunctionality. Drained of civic values and lacking a commanding vision, the central institutions of liberal democracy have atrophied, undermining not only civic obligations and informed and engaged citizenry, but also historical memory and the public's capacity to discern the truth from falsehoods. What must be stressed here is that neoliberal, neoliberalism is not just an economic system, but also an ideological and cultural formation that functions as a powerful educational force. Its presence is on, the, is on display daily in the rise of corporate controlled social media that have accelerated a culture of surveillance, consumption, distraction, immediacy, and the spectacle of violence. In this overabundance of civic glut, language has succumbed to the aesthetics of vulgarity and conspiracy theories. What's new about the current historical moment is that the attack on the welfare state common good and those considered disposable is increasingly legitimated through oppressive forms of education in a variety of spaces and cultural forms, such as newspapers, social media, magazines, and popular culture. This merging of culture, power, and politics represents a new stage in the development of capitalist society, one in which left-leaning and mainstream cultural apparatuses from schools to the digital media are now under attack, while right-wing media push authoritarian impulses and minority rule, displacing the necessity of tanks or massive displays of state repression with the colonizing of mass consciousness. Authoritarian populism and economic nationalism are now normalized in an anti-democratic culture that is constructed uh, partially or partly through the deep grammar of oppressive forms of education and the struggle over consciousness, agency, and values in a number of diverse sites. This updated neoliberal landscape is defined through a pandemic of willful ignorance. Moreover, this culture of denial with its contempt for evidence, justice, and democracy has not only been reinforced and reciprocated at the highest levels of government, but it also has been endlessly reiterated by powerful conservative traditional and social media outlets. One result is that the distinction between fact and fiction disappears. And somewhere along the way, the democratization of the flow of information becomes the democratization of the flow of disinformation. Lost here is a critical language capable of producing a narrative that promotes shared values and enables people to develop the sustained connections crucial to a vibrant democracy. Think about Fox News, for instance, and its worldwide reach. To me, Fox News is a criminal organization. It's not it's simply a, 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 an, an alleged journalist, an outlet for the news. I mean, this is basically an adjunct of right-wing governments perpetuating all kinds of nonsense in the interest of both ratings and the interest of supporting those political interests that support it. As you all know, I don't have to tell you that. In the United States, the language of manufactured ignorance is on full display in the Republican Party's campaign of misinformation and lies about the pandemic and the continuing claim that the presidential election was stolen. This is a white supremacist and neo-fascist party that thrives in a culture of spectacle, entertainment, and distraction. It has drained politics of any substantive meaning, given its efforts to both uh, uh, infantilize and depoliticize the public while disdaining any effort at critical analysis, translation, or self-reflection. All that seems to be left is what Viktor Frankl in 1965 called the mask of nihilism. Oppressive forms of education have become central elements of an America threatened by a number of pandemics that endanger human life and the planet itself, and of course, not just the United States. The coronavirus pandemic now works in tandem with corporate media conglomerates to produce identities defined narrowly by market values while normalizing a stripped down notion of individual responsibility that convinces people that whatever problems they face, have no one, they have no one to blame but themselves. I can't stress enough how pernicious this ideology is and how depoliticizing it is. In this logic, 
individual interests are the only reality that matters. And those interests are purely monetary. In addition, this market-based ideology operates under the, under the false depoliticizing assumption that there are only individual solutions to systemic and socially produced problems. This ideology reinforces states of individual alienation, isolation, anger, while it increasingly renders human beings numb, fearful, and immune to the demands of economic social and social justice. There, I mean, in, in, in many ways, what we see is a, a massive disimagination machine at work in producing this kind of, this individualizing ideology that basically prevents people from translating private troubles into larger systemic considerations. And I'll mention that again. Dealing with life's, life's problem becomes a solitary affair, reducing matters of social responsibility to a regressive and depoliticized notion of individual choice. In this instance, the political becomes regressively personal, rendering difficult any critical understanding of systemic forces while undermining any viable notion of critical agency and collective resistance. As the connection between democracy and education withers, hope becomes the enemy of agency and agency is reduced to learning how to survive rather than working to shape the conditions that bear down on one's life in general. This paralyzing form of depoliticization with its refiguring of the social sphere, individual responsibility, historical memory, critical thinking and collective identity reinforces an acute indifference, withdrawal from public life and a disdain from politics, or it contributes further to the habits of hate, to the habits of racism, the habits of white supremacy, the habits of cultural nationalism and so forth and so on. The COVID-19 plague has produced an age of uncertainty, fragmentation, despair, and dire foreboding about the future. More troubling, is the apprehension that the present crisis has an air of longevity about it, constituting an irreversible turning point in history. The good news is that the pandemic has revealed in all of its ugliness, the death producing mechanisms of institutional and systemic racism, the increasingly dangerous assault on the environment and an anti-intellectual culture that derides any notion of dissent or critical education. That is an education that helps people to think critically, engage in thoughtful dialogue, learn the lessons of history and develop the capacity to hold power accountable. The ugliness of raw oppressive power can no longer hide in the shadows. The pandemic has turn, turn, torn away the cover of a neoliberal economic system marked by what Thomas Piketty calls the violence of social inequality. Power has now been made visible with its hope for change. Moreover, the claim for economic and social justice have grown louder, louder in a time of rising authoritarianism. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine a more urgent moment for taking seriously ongoing attempts to make education central to politics. At stake here is the notion that education is a social concept rooted in the goal of emancipation for all people. Moreover, this is an education that is not in content to simply encourage critical thinking, but also to inspire and to energize people, it seems to me, to become engaged social agents. This is a pedagogy that calls us beyond ourselves and engages the ethical imperative to care for others, dismantle structures of domination, and to become a subject rather than the object of history or put, to put it differently, to become an object of history, politics, and power. Pedagogy in this sense provides or should provide the knowledge, truths, and values that enable people to govern rather than be governed. If we're going to develop a politics capable of awakening a critical imaginative and historical sensibility, it's crucial for educators to reclaim matters of civic literacy, civic courage, and the ethical and political demands that sustain a substantive democracy. Moreover, it seems to me, it's crucial in a time of violence to teach the practice of freedom and civic engagement and not just the truth. This is a political project in which civic literacy infused with the language of critique and possibility takes seriously the notion that there is no democracy without informed citizens. Such a language is necessary to enable the conditions to forge 
a collective international resistance among educators, youth, artists, and other cultural workers in defense of public goods and radical democracy itself. Such a movement is important to resist and overcome the tyrannical fascist nightmares that have descended upon the United States, Brazil, Hungary, and a number of other countries plagued by the rise of right-wing authoritarianism and of course the rise of neo-Nazi parties. In an age of social isolation, information overflow, a culture of immediacy and consumer glut and spectacularized violence, it's all the more crucial to take seriously the notion that a democracy cannot exist or be defended without institutions and ideas that uphold and develop the capacities to think critically and act with a degree of ethical and social responsibility. In this sense, politics becomes educative, changing the way people see themselves while awakening more critical modes of meaning, analysis, and identification. <clears throat> One crucial pedagogical lesson to remember is that fascism begins with language, the demonization of others considered disposable, and moves on to attack ideas, the burning of books, the disappearance of intellectuals, and the emergence of the carceral state and the horrors of detention jails and camps. As a form of cultural politics, critical pedagogy should provide the promise of a protected space within which to think against the grain of received opinion and hold power accountable. This is a space to question and challenge to imagine the world diff from different standpoints and perspectives and to reflect upon ourselves in relation to others, the larger world, and in doing so, to understand what it means to assume a sense of political and social responsibility. As Gayatri Spivak has argued, this is a space in which educators can no longer insist on the importance of training in a time of legitimized violence. And I'll just say one thing about this. In the age of the pandemic, one of the things that I find enormously regressive and unfortunate is I find most of my colleagues in education are now just simply talking about Zoom, talking about teams, talking about methods, talking about a form of instrumental rationality that has been raised to a level of importance, unlike anything I have ever seen. And I was born just after Lincoln died. I mean, this is just hard to believe. Um, it has become utterly methodological with no sense of the content and the substantive nature of pedagogy and how important that is to drive what we're doing, not mastering whether or not we're, you know, we have so many chat rooms open at one time and so forth and so on. All of you know, you know, I think but probably what I'm talking about here. Uh, education is both a, in both its symbolic and institutional forms has a central role to play in fighting the emergence of fascist culture, mythic historical narratives, and the emerging ideologies of white supremacy and white nationalism. Moreover, as neo-fascist white militia groups and other right-wing extremists across the, across the globe are disseminating toxic, racist, and ultra-nationalist images of the past, it's absolutely crucial to reclaim pedagogy as a form of historical consciousness and moral witnessing. History in this case is not sacred. It's something to be interrogated and to learn from. Education as a form of cultural work extends far beyond the classroom and its, ped and its pedagogical influence, while often imperceptible, is crucial to challenging the rise and resisting of fascist pedagogical formations and their rehabilitation of fascist principles and ideas. This is especially true at a time when historical and social amnesia have become a national pastime, matched by the masculinization of the public sphere and the increasing rise of a fascist politics that thrives on ignorance, fear, the suppression of dissent, and of course, violence. What is clear is that neoliberal modes of education attempt to mold students as brands, consumers, commodities, and agents of capital. Young people are now told to invest in their careers, pack their resumes, and achieve success at any cost. It is precisely this replacement of educated hope with an aggressive dystopian neoliberal project, project and cultural politics that now characterizes the current assault on all levels of education in various parts of the globe. Universities now define themselves to the corporate language of efficiency, reduced governance to, margin, to managerialism, and define the faculty as part-time workers, 
subject to the same rules of the market that one finds in governing labor relations in other sites of corporate capital, such as Amazon, Facebook, and in the United States, Walmart. It's crucial for educators to remember that language is not simply an instrument of fear, violence, and intimidation. It's also a vehicle of critique, civic courage, resistance, and engaged and informed agency. We live at a time when the language and ideals of democracy have been pillaged, stripped of their promises and hopes. If the new forms of fascism would be defeated, there's a need to make education an organizing principle of politics. And in part, this can be done with a language that exposes and unravels falsehoods, systems of oppression, and corrupt relations of power, while making clear that alternative futures are possible. Hannah Harant was right in arguing that language is crucial to highlight the often hidden, crystallized elements that make fascism likely. Paul Gilroy argues correctly that it's crucial in the historical moment to re-engage with fascism in order to address how it is crystallized in different forms. And in doing so, to work towards redeeming the term from its trivialization and restore it to its proper place in the discussion of political and moral limits regarding what is acceptable. Fascism is never entirely rele relegated to the past. And while it may go into remission, it never entirely disappears. What is clear in the current moment is that the conditions that produce totalitarian forms are with us once, are with us once again, appearing in different forms across the globe. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, matters of criticism, informed judgment, and critical modes of understanding are crucial in making a choice between authoritarianism and democracy, life and death. The stock choices regarding what the future might look like appears to hang between the forces of despotism and the forces of, of a radical democracy. Yet, as ominous as this appears, history is open and it will unfold and how it will unfold hangs in the balance. History is in the midst of a global crisis that offers the opportunity to shift popular consciousness and to move in the direction of radical change. This pandemic is a crisis that cannot be allowed to turn into a catastrophe in which all hope is lost. While the pandemic threatens democracy's ability to breathe, it should also offer up the possibility to rethink politics and the habits of critical education, human agency, and elements of social responsibility crucial to any viable notion of what life would be or what it would be like in a democratic society. There's a need to use social and cultural apparatuses to engage in the process of popular education in order to promote an anti-capitalist consciousness. An issue here is the need to make clear that democracy and capitalism are not synonymous and that one has to be disentangled from the other. Central to this task is the necessity to create new arenas of struggle, a revival of the civic imagination, create institutions that can meet the needs of all people and develop an inspired and energized international struggle once again for radical democracy. This is both a political project and an educational challenge given the need to break through the corrosive common sense belief that there is no alternative to the existing society with its dangerous notions of agency values and its disregard for the common good. Education operates as a crucial site of power in the modern world. And if educators and other cultural workers are truly concerned about safeguarding it, they'll have to take seriously how pedagogy functions at the local and global levels. Critical pedagogy, if not border pedagogy, has an important role to play in both understanding and challenging how power, knowledge, and values are deployed, affirmed, and resisted within and outside of traditional discourses and cultural spheres. In a local context, critical pedagogy becomes an important theoretical tool for understanding the institutional conditions that place constraints on the production of knowledge, learning, academic labor, social relations, and democracy itself. Let me give you a small example. In the United States right now, you have a far right-wing Republican party that governs a number of states that are introducing all kinds of laws claiming that educators cannot talk about racism in the curriculum, whether on the public school level or at the level of higher education. And if institutions allow this to happen, they will be defunded. 
that state and uh, local governments will basically defund these institutions. I mean, this is unheard of. I mean, this is something you'd expect right out of the playbook of Nazi Germany, right out of fascist Italy in the 1930s, right out of Pinochet's regime in the 1970s. This is a blatant attack on something that should give us hope. And that is ideas are dangerous and teachers are dangerous and that we matter. And that in this fight against fascism, we are actually the pillars of civic society and offer the possibility for resistance and, to, and struggle. It seems to me that in taking up, if pedagogy is going to function as a form of production and critique and offer a discourse of possibility, it has to offer a way of providing students with the opportunity to link understanding to commitment and social transformation to seeking the greatest possible justice. You know, there are people now into that issues. Well, I have a message for them. And the message is very simple. First of all, if you don't understand an issue, it's hard to address it. <laughs> and secondly, understanding an issue doesn't mean that you remain locked into a set of ideas that can't be translated into a set of collective and massive forms of resistance. So these dichotomies are not only false, it seems to me they spread the very problems that they claim that they're somehow attacking. It seems to me that in taking up this project, educators and others should attempt to create the conditions that gives students clearly the opportunity to become critical, engaged citizens, and to, in, in a sense, make hope convincing and despair uh, dis, uh, not, simply not practical. I, I, there, there, there seems to be an attempt on the part of many intellectuals to drown in the language of critique. And I under, we all understand that, but it's not enough. I mean, we have to be able to provide alternative visions. We have to be able to provide an alternative sense of what the future might look like. What does it mean to talk about a future that doesn't replic replicate the present? How do we talk about that in terms of public health? How do we talk about that in terms of social needs? How do we talk about that in terms of critical citizenship? How do we talk about that in terms of justice? How do we talk about that in terms of what it means for people not to labor under a notion of time, which in some ways is always a liability? How do we talk about agencies that are not constrained simply by a politics of survival? And what are the institutional conditions and relations of power that make that possible? Educated hope provides the basis for dignifying the labor of teachers. It offers up critical knowledge linked to democratic social change, affirms shared responsibilities, and should encourage students and teachers to recognize ambivalence and uncertainty as fundamental dimensions of learning. Such hope offers the possibility of thinking beyond the given. And as difficult as this task may seem to educators, if not to a larger public, it's a struggle worth waging. The current fight against a nation, a nascent fascism across the globe is not only a struggle over economic structures or the commanding heights of political and corporate power. It's also a struggle over visions, ideas, consciousness, and the power to shift culture itself. It's also, as Arant points out, a struggle against the widespread fear of judging. Without the ability to judge, it becomes impossible to recover words that have meaning. Imagine a future that does not mimic the dark times in which we live and create a language that changes how we think about ourselves and our relationship to others. Any struggle for a radical democratic socialist order will not take place if the lessons from our dark past cannot be learned and transformed into constructive resolutions and solutions for struggling and creating a post-capitalist society. Once again, there is no democracy without informed citizens and no justice without a language critical of injustice. Democracy begins to fail and political life becomes impoverished in the absence of those vital public spheres and elements of civic culture, such as the arts and higher education that produce civic values, public scholarship, and a form of social engagement that allow for a more imaginative grasp of the future, one that, allows, one that allows us to think otherwise in order to act otherwise. Democracy should be a way of thinking about education, one that thrives on connecting pedagogy to the practice of freedom, learning to ethics and agency to the imperatives of social responsibility and the public good. Without hope, there is no agency. And without collective agents, there is no hope of resistance. And in, in the age of nascent fascism, it's not enough to connect education with the defense of reason, informed judgment, and critical agency. It must also be aligned with the power and the potential of collective resistance. We live in dangerous times. 
making it all the more urgent for more individuals, labor unions, and social movements to come together in the belief that the current regimes of tyranny can be resisted, that alternative futures are possible, and that acting on these beliefs through collective resistance will make radical change happen. Democracy needs a vision rooted in a deep politics of solidarity that enables people to fight against the forces of authoritarianism and to overcome them. Resistance is no longer an option, it's a necessity. Goyo was right when he warned, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Giroux. I, I really don't know how to thank you for your absolutely, absolutely fantastic lecture, Professor Giroux. I think this is exactly what we wanted to hear and this is exactly what we needed to hear. And I think what, uh, what you spoke about in your lecture is what you embody, which is to give us hope. And I think uh, this is exactly what we need to hear from, uh, from educators, from people in, uh, in education who can not just give hope to their peers like us uh, sitting here in India across thousands of miles, but I think also the possibility that there is a, there is, uh, there is a need to build sol solidarities in the face of the kind of onslaughts that we've been facing. So I think, uh, Professor Giro, I think for me, the most valuable part of your lecture, of course, is everything else that you said, but also the fact that we can't simply uh, sit pretty on the idea of offering critiques, but we have to be able to give an alternative vision, to be able to give hope, to be able to tell that there is a possibility of a language which can actually give us uh, access to truth, which can counter the kind of disinformation, uh, the kind of falsities, the kind of half truths and post post truths that we seem to encounter, uh, you know, in Fox in Fox Media and in our daily lives on social media, etc. So I think. Professor Giro, we can't thank you enough. Uh, uh, for me, the most important, uh, I mean, of course, one, one has heard and one has read so much of your work, uh, but the fact that you can, uh, you've can, you been able to inspire us to think that, uh, that a radical democ democracy is possible and it's not something which is out there, it is something which is worth fighting for. And all of us in the business of education, I mean, that's a bad, wrong metaphor, but I mean, all of us in, engaged in the, in the public good of education have to finally fight for this particular goal and that can happen through this critical pedagogy that we need to make part of our everyday lives. Professor Giro, I can't thank you enough. Uh, so, so grateful for those uh, for that inspiring lecture and for those words. Uh, they'll resonate with us and we'll think about them for a long time to come and we will draw inspiration from what you've said. And hopefully it'll foster a certain idea of a critical uh, pedagogical uh, shift that we need to bring about in the kind of onslaught that our education institutions have been facing under the thrall of neoliberalism and under the thrall of the kind of governments that we seem to be uh, working under. And so thank you, Professor Giro. I'm so, so grateful for your, for your absolutely delightful and absolutely inspi inspiring lecture. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody that we couldn't have had a better lecture. We couldn't have had a uh, greater uh, hope giving lecture, greater inspiring lecture than yours, Professor Giro. Thank you so very much. And now you know, I, I think, yeah. I, I just want to say, look, you know, I'm looking at the screen and I see, you know, I see a number of women here, you know, who are energized and alive on the forefront of a political struggle that matters, who are reaching out across international borders, who refuse to be gated intellectuals, who have the courage to speak out. I'm the one who's inspired. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I must say, uh, you know, ideas are meaningless when you when you can't connect with others, when others can't inspire you, when you can't collectively feel a sense of solidarity in which we're not talking about people who get awards and all that shit. You know, we're, we're really talking about people who care collectively and want to make a difference. So let me thank you. OK, <laughs> you don't have to thank me. I thank you for allowing me to be here. No, you're too kind, Professor Giroux, and, 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 and I think what you said that ideas are dangerous, teachers are dangerous, universities are dangerous, I think that is exactly the kind of, yeah, uh, you know, power with which we have to speak and we have to fight and we have to uh, create an alternative world. And thank you so much, Professor Giroux, and yeah. I'm sure there are many, many questions for you, and so I'll, I'll pass on the responsibility to my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malhotra. Let me just echo Professor Malhotra's words and just say that I'm, I'm truly in admiration. I really am. And as for my task today, it's going to be very difficult because the chat box is literally flooding, flooding with questions. So uh, there are many, many, but I'm going to try and do my best, Professor Giroux. 
uh, in selecting a few of them and perhaps clubbing some questions which are allied to each other. Uh, but thank you. Thank you once again. Very inspired and very happy. So on that note, I'd like to begin with a comment uh, by Dr. A. Sean Poe. He commented um, right when you were making the comment about Fox News. So I thought I'll just start with that. The comment says, so right about Fox News. I want to make a Raspberry Pi with computer vision that when it sees the logo, it will turn off the TV. Uh, so that's the comment. Shall I move into the questions to the questions, Professor Juru? Sure. Perfect. Uh, so the first question is from Abhishek. Maybe, 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 maybe I should respond to that. Uh, ah, go ahead. I, I don't think the issue is turning off Fox News. I, I, I think the issue is we need to hear Fox News to be able to fight what it says. But I, but I also think the real issue is <clears throat> we need to create students who are cultural producers and not just cultural critics, because we need to create alternative spheres in which people can basically fight this stuff on a massive level across the globe. And we're not going to do it by working within corporations. We're not going to do it by working for Disney. You know, we're not going to do it. I mean, I think it's great to infiltrate these places and get to, you know, subvert them from, behind, from, from within. But we have to have one foot in and one foot out. And that one foot out is really crucial in creating, uh, it, it seems to me, educational cultural spheres where students have an opportunity to give voice the positions that often are suppressed and intellectuals give voice to positions that are suppressed and, and basically marginalized. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Professor. So the next question is from, well, the first question is from Abhishek Pandir and the question is as it follows. Despite the growing crisis, not merely public health and exposure of inequalities, the world has not moved an inch towards embracing a socialist vision. On the obverse, fragility of some socialist states is revealed, and with that, an authoritarian impulse of these states to curb dissent. How can we make sense of it within the framework of critical pedagogy that rationally argue for socialism? And question number B is, in your book, you rightfully call out Trumpism, which would remain long after Trump is ousted. But perhaps critical pedagogy has to reveal the subsistence that Trudeauism provides to Trumpism? Question mark. Can, can you give me the last sentence again? Yes, sure. So in your book, you rightly call out Trumpism, which would remain long after Trump is ousted. But right. perhaps critical pedagogy has to reveal the subsistence that Trudeauism provides to Trumpism? Yeah, okay, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I, I think that power becomes... Uh, most deadly when it when it hides in the shadows, and I and I think that one of the things that we need to understand about Trumpism and about the rise of fascism across the globe <clears throat> is what are the conditions that give rise to it, and it seems to me that you know I've talked about a number of things in this talk today, but the, one of, some of the things that I find increasingly important is that modes of pedagogy have developed out of neoliberalism, out of a, a variety of neo-fascist pro projects that take the question of consciousness very seriously and take the question of identity very seriously. And in a sense, a, a very, very sharp about mobilizing those passions, those modes of identifications, those needs that speak to people in a way that offer a sense of hope within a sense of false promises. And the false promises are a society marked by racial cleansing, a society marked by racial purity, a society marked by economic nationalism. So it seems to me they mobilize a notion of critique coupled with a notion of hope based on a set of assumptions that point to needs that are simply misdirected. And I think that what critical pedagogy needs to do is to understand what those needs are rather than simply shame people and, and to talk about what their lives could be like at, a, at the level of daily life in which they won't be simply angry and struggling to survive or to believe that blaming others for the problems that they have, particularly those others who are Muslim, those others who are black, those others who are the precariat, those others who are young people, are not really the cause of the problems. So if, 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 if critical pedagogy means anything, and I think it does, I think it's awakening people's consciousness to the need to reclaim different modes of analyses to be able to understand historically, politically, socially, and economically, the conditions in which they find themselves. I mean, for me, this question is, is very interesting because Stuart Hall once said, a politics that matters has to be about a politics of identification. Not a politics of identity, identification. How we get people to identify with a language in which they can recognize themselves. 
in which they can recognize their needs, but they can shift their consciousness in ways to be able to understand those needs and how they're being addressed by right-wing uh, relations of power and disimagination machines, so they can both see through them and see beyond them. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Professor. I'll move on to the next question. I'm going to uh, put together a couple of questions and I hope that's okay. Uh, the first question here is from Mamun. He writes, how may we address the irony of critiquing technology, system of disinformation, and the pedagogy we are deeply immersed in? Allied to that is a question from Disha Sharma. Thank you so much for this insightful lecture. Can you please highlight the relationship between only using online education during the pandemic in, uh, and neoliberalism? I, you know, we, we may have to start taking these questions separately because there, there are too many questions and they're merging into each other. And yeah. I, I get lost following the first question when I'm listening to the second question. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, can you give me the first question again? Sure. I, because I want to address that, if sure. you don't mind. All right. <clears throat> How may we address the irony of critiquing technology, system of disinf disinformation, and the pedagogy we are deeply immersed yeah, in? Yeah, good, good, terrific. I don't think it's an irony. Uh, I, I don't think that we're presupposing that technology is in and of itself terrible, or basically uh, it can only be used for purposes of, of uh, reinforcing relations of disempowerment. I think the real issue here is what are the conditions in which this technology is being used? What kind of social relationship is, is, it, is it shaping in alignment with neoliberal values, considerations, and politics? And how might we challenge that using the same technology? Uh, there are some technologies that, of course, you know, that, that are deeply disturbing in, in terms of the rise of robotics in, in, in some way, particularly as part of the national security state and the war machine and what that means. But it seems to me you can also talk about robotics in terms of what it might mean to provide medical, medical care for people across the globe. So I, I think the question of technology is an utterly political question and not simply a technological question. So to root that in political considerations and questions of values in the public good, as opposed to simply criticizing it without looking at the historical and political conditions that shape it in a particular way is a mistake. It's a terrible mistake because there are gonna be people who say, look, I live in a, a, up in a, a, the Northern part of India, for instance, and I have access to education through this technology. I, I can't, I'm too poor, I can't travel. This, is a, this helps what I do. I mean, we have to be very careful and be more dialectical and more political around what the social benefits of, of, of particular technology or any technology might be and what it means. That's very simplistic, but I think in some way it, it addresses the question. Can you give me the second one now? Sure. Uh, the second one is from Disha. Uh, thank you again so much for the insightful lecture. Can you please highlight the relationship between online classes, as in the online medium, and the pandemic in during the pandemic in relation to neoliberalism? I mean, for me, I want to look at online education within the concept of the neoliberal university. That's where I want to begin. I don't want to begin by saying, oh, in the nature of the pandemic, online education is a medical necessity and a public health issue, and we need to certainly value it in terms of, of those considerations. That's a very limited issue, because it seems to me we cannot understand online education without at the same time understanding the increasing corporatization of the university since the 1980s and in the 1970s, and the attack on labor unions, the attack on faculty, uh, the constant precarious position in which faculty find themselves, uh, the constant disempowering of faculty, and the moving of governance to a ne neoliberal mindset that basically is about the accumulation of capital and profits, and the notion that students are simply clients and consumers, <laughs> you know, and that we're not educating for critical citizenship, or we're not educating to make people engaged and informed citizens capable of sustaining a democracy, which always has to be fought over. So it seems to me that uh, the, the real issue here is to, to ask ourselves, given the current state of higher education across the globe, and it's increasingly de-democratization, how do we want to address online education? How does it reinforce that as opposed to simply uh, challenge it. I mean, and, and how does it do that in the midst of a discourse that is utterly depoliticized and simply medicalized or subject to simply the logic of instrumental rationality? That's a mistake. So we need to broaden the horizons 
politically, culturally, socially around online education and put it in a context where we can understand not just simply its necessity in a moment of pandemic crisis, but its political value in a moment when the university is using it to basically shrink faculty, to basically get rid of subjects that don't translate immediately into a business culture, uh, to consolidate power in the hands of an even a, a more technical instrumental elite, and to reinforce notions of instrumental rationality. Thank you, Professor. Uh, moving on to the next question. This is by Lucy Harding. She says, do you think it is important for teachers or lecturers to be politically active? As a teacher educator against the neoliberal system, I'm finding myself being ever more critical of the Department of Education in UK when talking to my trainee teachers. I'm promoting teacher activists against racism, classism, fascism, it is taking courage, but I'm fearful of this impacting my career. How can I maintain my values and awaken others, but still be part of the system? There is also another question. If, if you permit, I will just present it to you. This is from Deepesh C. And he asks, how do teachers in private universities negotiate the need for critical pedagogy and the need to work within this university? Should teachers start the critical pedagogy project step by step, or should we only aim for radical pedagogy in our classrooms? I, I first let me take the first question and, and say how how yes. courageous that question is. First of all, I, I mean because it it does something that's very difficult for many of us to do, and that is to link the political with the personal, and to recognize that they 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 don't just collapse. The political doesn't just collapse into the personal, and the personal doesn't just collapse into the person into the political. I mean I. I, I think that, first of all, you know, when I went up for tenure in the 1970s, before some of you were born, um, you know, I, 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 I was denied tenure in my first job by a right-wing president because I was writing about radical pedagogy, 1981 to be exact. And I remember walking out of that meeting being told that I would not get tenure because of what I wrote. And I walked into the school and there were a bunch of janitors there waiting for me that I had worked with get, helping them get their graduate education diplomas, high school diplomas. And he said, you know, one of them said to me, you know, I know a terrible time for you. He said, you know, but it's better to live standing up than on your knees. And I, I, I don't mean to be too simplistic about this, but I think that when we engage in work that matters, we have to take risks. That's a central element of what it means to be a critical educator. You have to take risk. You have to be honest with yourself. That's not to say that you should put yourself in a position where all of a sudden you're gonna be penniless, homeless, and living on the street. But I think it means you need to negotiate in ways in which you can do the best that you can, to be as courageous as you can, and to not do it alone, to do it with others, to try to build groups of people around you that offer support, and to push against the grain in ways that are not stupid, but are not compromising either. You know, to ma manage the field in which we work, uh, to have, as I've said many times, one foot in and one foot out. And what I mean by that, and this in part addresses the second question, no, I don't think that critical pedagogy is something you do outside the university or outside of public schools. And I, and I, I, I don't think that uh, anybody is not political, even though they claim they're political when they're in the classroom. We make choices about what we teach. We make choices about the knowledge we use. We make choices about how we view the future. We make choices about the kinds of agencies we're going to produce. We make choices about the narratives that matter and those that don't. We make choices about what's in and what's out. It's as simple as that. These are political choices. I'm sorry. You know, you, so we're always in the midst of a political site. Education is ultimately political because it's directive, as my friend Paulo Freire used to say. Pedagogy is interventional. Pedagogy of all sorts is an intervention. That's political. I'm sorry. So you, you're not going to get away from that. The real question is how do you become more conscious of it in ways that enable you to be a resource and to, in, in some way, change a classroom or help students to become more independent, critical, self-reflective, self and be, be able to basically enter a world in which they can shape in fundamental ways as critical and engaged agents, and not simply as, as automatons, right? Or not to confuse education with training. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, we need to do the best, yeah, that 
First of all, education is an enormously crucial site and nobody should ever say we should withdraw from it. Secondly, power is not just simply about domination. Power is also about resistance. There is no site that is entirely governed by domination, entirely. Resistance is always there in different ways and we have to find ways to identify the best ways to exercise it and to make it come. Thank you, Professor Jiru. On that note, the next question is from Praveen Kumar. He says, Professor Jiru, you have brought out the dangers and distortions that capitalism, racism, authoritarianism, etc., have forced on the world, creating almost a nightmarish situation. Do you find the emergence of some indicators which could possibly counter the state of hopelessness? Yeah, this meeting. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I do. I, there are youth movements emerging all over the world. Are you kidding? I mean, that are basically not only international, but they're connecting the dots. I mean, the thing that's very different from my generation in the 1960s is that uh, in, the, in, in the struggles, for instance, in the United States and in Brazil and in Chile uh, and in India in, in some way, what we're seeing, we're seeing people who are going beyond single issue movements, who are basically connecting these movements in ways in which if you want to talk about the attack on public education, you have to talk about neoliberalism. You have to do that. You have to talk about militarism. You, you can't ignore this. Uh, you, you, want to, you, want to, you want to talk about basically poverty and homelessness? You have to talk about economic inequality. I'm sorry. You know, global inequality. You want to talk about the death of the planet? It's a pending death. Then you've got to talk about capitalism in all of its form as, as a death machine and what that means and how we unravel that. And I, and I think this emergence of a comprehensive politics that we see uh, in, in terms of the way in which these issues are, are being analyzed is very, very important. The social movements that we're seeing, particularly driven by young people, is like nothing I've ever seen before. Think about the death of George Floyd and what it did. It mobilized not just people in the local community, not just people in the United States, it mobilized people all over the world because they re related to that injustice as something that relates to their lives in their particular societies, in that particular cultural context. Unbelievable. Secondly, believe it or not, for all of my attacks on what I call the disimagination machines, <clears throat> the cultural sphere has become so crucial as a site of education, has become so powerful uh, in terms of the ways in which it can change consciousness, mobilize identities, and organize forms of collective resistance, that that has to be seen not just as a field of domination, but also as an amazing site and challenge to educate people to use it in terms of new forms of cultural politics that will be able to arouse new forms of alliances and, and, and so forth and so on. Thirdly, I, I really think that what we see throughout the world today, whether it's in India, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in the UK, is we're seeing a crisis of legitimation. And what I mean by that is that these powerful narratives that operate like the divine right of kings, you know, that there's no such, there's no alternative to capitalism. Uh, everybody's being lifted up, uh, you know, uh, that the only way you can get by is by, you know, by exercising individual responsibility. These are dying. And granted, there's a mobilization of right-wing groups that buy into the stuff in the wrong way. But there's also the mobilization of lots of people for whom education has become a critical site to understand these problems in new ways. So it seems to me that these three movements give me an enormous amount of hope. I'm not, I, I don't see how you could be fatalistic and call yourself a radical. I mean, I, I just don't understand that. I mean, I, I think that once you give up hope, once you stop looking for alternative ways to be in the world, you don't just become cynical, you become complicit. And that's different. That, that carries a much greater weight in terms of social responsibility, in terms of consciousness, in terms of ethics, in terms of where you are in relation to justice. You fight to the end. That's what you do. And you do it with courage and you take risk. If we can't take risk, we can't exercise courage, we're in their camp. I don't want to be in their camp. And I think a lot of the other people don't want to be in their camp. True, thank you. Thank you, Professor Juru. Would you like me to take more questions or- Why don't we have one more? One more, okay, here we go. Is that okay with all of you? 
certainly it's our pleasure it's it's absolutely our pleasure we go on all night i mean night in india that is hearing you and listening to you I'll th- let's take one more and then sure. i'll go have breakfast <laughs> all right it's a combination of a comment and a question so i'll just this sure. is from dr atfar shah and this is uh, the comment and the question is as follows professor jiru i think the idea of freedom freedom has failed while i agree that critical pedagogy needs to be developed but what about the already established and normalized surveillance and checkpoints will it pass through and become the become part of curriculum globally when it needs where it needs bureaucratic approvals and has to pass through filters of technocratic capitalism that has colonized the life world uh if i could just add there was another comment that uh, dr atfar shah has also made i think neoliberalism is a political project has shaped up a neoliberal health system i think the neoliberalism is part of the world has shaped social transformation um and this relates to what alric beck calls risk society that's a different comment which i just thought i'll read it together perhaps i, I, I know right i mean you know right i think my entire talk is based on the assumption that neoliberalism is a political project i think what i don't want to do is reduce it to simply a politics of economics i think that's a mistake i think if you really want to talk about the grip that neoliberalism has on people you better stop talking about simply stop talk simply not talk simply about economic structures and really talk about the shaping of consciousness identities agencies values and what it means for people to understand themselves in a world in which they've been written out of history in which they've been canceled out of the future i think that's that's basically the issue we need to address uh yes I, of course there are checkpoints and of course there are filters and of course there are attempts to repress in many ways critical pedagogy or any other form of political resistance it doesn't mean that they're successful it just means that they recognize how dangerous we are and i think i'm more hopeful about that than i am about a notion of domination that is so all encompassing that nothing can be done i i think let, let me just say one other thing about the question of freedom uh you know i i think we're all trying to work through this in some fundamental way and i i think what i'm about to write about and, and trying to think about with this very limited brain that i have is that uh you know freedom has really been hijacked and it's been hijacked by a neoliberal ethic that seems to suggest that it's synonymous with self interest and devoid of any sense of ethical uh, uh, responsibility and notion of collective consciousness and can separate itself from the common good we have to fight this notion of freedom we have to fight it by reclaiming the notion of the social we have to fight it by reclaiming the notion of the common good we have to talk about the limits of freedom in the interest of neoliberal domination we have to talk about freedom as giving voice to people collectively so that we can talk about what the conditions are that make freedom possible and not freedom in the sense of don't bother with me or i should be able to do anything i i want but freedom from the fear of poverty freedom from the fear of injustice freedom from the fear of of cultural nationalism freedom from the fear of militarism and imperialism toxic masculinity you know freedom from the fear of massive injustices freedom from the fear of the planet ending in the next few days or the next few years that's what freedom is about and that's what we need to focus on thank you um thank you so much professor juru for your patience and your inspirational words i'll now hand over to um zara for for the vote of thanks thank you very much again thank you so much susan good evening everyone it has been such a wonderful event and i don't think any of us want it to get over in time soon but we don't want professor jiru to go hungry anymore so on the behalf of the department of english and the organizing team i would like to thank everyone who made this event so successful first and foremost a huge thank you to our speaker professor jiru who has been so kind to us by giving us so much to think about we will no doubt be talking about today's discussion and your continuing work for quite some time into the future thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us as always thank you to our hod professor sunil mitra who is the leading force behind this exercise given today's talk thank you also to sat yes absolutely please go ahead thank you everybody good night simi thank you for everything Professor Jiro, such yeah. a pleasure. Please, thanks so much. We are so grateful, Professor Jiro. I don't have words to thank you for. It was so important. Uh, my, my, for you, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. So I'll just take a second to thank our wonderful team who works behind the scenes. 
So thank you, Sakshi Shraddha and Susan and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our events so smoothly always. And thank you to our audience for always turning up for us. It's wonderful to see both old and new faces every time. And I would like to use this opportunity to invite you all for the next lecture in this series, which will be delivered by Professor Gauri Vishnathan, who is the class of 1933 professor in the humanities and former director of the South Asia Institute at Columbia University. She's going to deliver a lecture on animal life and alternative religions in 19th century genealogies of feminism. Uh, please tune in on 3rd September 2021 at exactly the same time, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. IST. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Please stay safe and be well. <laughs>